All right, can everybody see my first slide? Thumbs up. Is my voice coming through okay? I got a microphone on here, so hopefully, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if there's any issues, uh, as I go along, if you can get my attention, uh, you can ask questions uh, or you can put them in the chat. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, Catherine will probably monitor that for me. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and, and uh, Catherine uh, brag me up. Hopefully I can uh, provide uh, something of interest and education for you tonight. <clears throat> the main topic that I'll be talking about, of course, is insects. And it's, it, it's as a supplement to your chapter in your Master Gardener manual, uh, this is not uh, about pest management per se. Uh, the first step of any kind of pest management is always going to be identification. You know, is this uh, creature that you're seeing, is it causing a problem? Uh, and, and if so, what are uh, the allowable and recommended um, uh, control measures? So again, you know, it's critical, but uh, a lot of the insects uh, actually, uh, they think about a tenth of 1% of all insect species are actually problems. So uh, hopefully, uh, I know a lot of gardeners have a, a negative a view of insects um, uh, in general, uh, but maybe after tonight you'll you'll realize that uh, there's a lot of them that <clears throat> are harmless or beneficial, and we need to be tolerant of them. <clears throat> Just some standard disclaimer. Um, so you probably had this back in school. Uh, the uh, you know, kind of the basic biology of creatures and, you know, what differentiates things, you know, mammals from birds, from fishes. And then, of course, with insects, they are an arthropod and, but they differ from, say, like ticks and mites or uh, spiders or uh, in, in exist, this example is the insect. You can see there's uh, differences in structures and body parts, and we'll, we'll get into that more. Uh, as Catherine said, I like grasshoppers, and uh, you'll see more pictures of grasshoppers in here. I like them because they obey the rules. They always have the, the parts that are uh, make an insect an insect. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish on other uh, insects, uh, uh, especially the immature ones, that, that they may not have the characters, that the diagnostic characters that make an insect an insect. So uh, insects have a three-part body. They have a head, a thorax. The thorax is where the legs and the wings originate. If they have wings, some insects don't have wings as adults, <clears throat> uh, and an abdomen. And uh, this uh, particular drawing here was one done by uh, Bill Stump. I don't know if, if he's uh, given his um, talk to you uh, on um, uh, plant pathology, but he's also a, a very good scientific illustrator back when he did this for UW. <clears throat> so uh, there are more different species of insects than any other uh, uh, type of animal in the world. Uh, and by species, I'm using the definition that uh, they, uh, to, to be a species, they have to breed with others of their species to produce fertile offspring. And <clears throat> at this point in time, we, we don't have all of them uh, cataloged and described as species. Uh, there's estimates out there uh, of the ones that have been described as science and given scientific names. There's over a million. <clears throat> and of course, that breaks down into the larger orders. Uh, insects uh, belong to orders, and uh, you'll learn more about that tonight. Uh, but again, uh, they're the most uh, diverse. Uh, the things like the beetles uh, in the hymenoptera, the bees, ants, wasps, and sawflies. Uh, but it's thought that the beetles are the most diverse order. Uh, and then of course, you have some minor orders that are, are uh, minor in name only, they, uh, they make up an important part of the insect diversity. Uh, when you compare that to other invertebrates, things that lack backbones, uh, approximately 310,000 plants, about 289,000, and then vertebrates, things with backbones like ourselves and birds and other mammals, fish, uh, those uh, reptiles, amphibians, about 60,000 different ones, and then other life, bacteria, fungi, uh, 176,000. So yeah, insects are very diverse and they play an important role in our environment. <clears throat> 
So in Wyoming, you know, uh, we have a, a relatively harsh climate. I know gardeners uh, are well aware of this. Uh, it can make it difficult to grow things here. Uh, but again, uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of diversity because we have a diversity of habitats, you know, from deserts to high alpine, um, you know, marshy areas to uh, extreme dry, uh, you know, forests, uh, sage or sagebrush step. Um, uh, in prairie. So again, diverse habitats, you get more different species of insects to uh, fill those niches. Um, <clears throat> it's thought that there's probably between 10 and 15,000 different species. We haven't cataloged them all here in Wyoming. I think we've gotten most all of the easy ones, things like grasshoppers, which are big and, and relatively easy to catch and, and look at. Although we are finding as uh, researchers do some genetic analysis of what we thought were you know, one species, we've lumped things together and they, are, they can be genetically uh, different even though they physically re resemble each other. But again, just to give you a sense, uh, you know, here in Wyoming, we probably have about three times the total diversity of insects as there are species of mammals on earth. Uh, so <clears throat> it's, it's certainly something to keep aware of. They, they're also, besides being very diverse, they're also the most numerous uh, types of animals. Uh, it's been estimated that insects outnumber humans at a ratio of about 200 million to one. Uh, on average, there are about 40 million insects on each acre of land, and that you know averages are always uh, uh, kind of uh, deceiving. In that, uh, certainly in the tropical forests, uh, you might have a lot of insects on an acre of land, whereas in the um, uh, Arctic, uh, you might have very few on an acre of land. <clears throat> uh, in the US, the continental US, it's thought the insect biomass is about 400 pounds of them per acre, while human biomass is only about 14 pounds per acre. And that one thing to keep in mind too is the soil. You know, the soil is alive. And so uh, there's a lot of arthropods in the soil, including insects and their close relatives, things like columbulins. Uh, so very, um, you know, important part of our ecosystems. So why are those, why are they so successful? <clears throat> uh, this is a picture that was taken in uh, uh, Northwest Africa of a desert locust swarm that my boss took. And it illustrates one of the things that have made insects so successful through uh, the eons of time, <clears throat> their ability to fly and, and exploit new habitats, move to areas where they can find the food that they need. Um, other features that they have that make them very successful is an exoskeleton, uh, a small size. Uh, I should go back to exoskeleton. You know, you think of our body, we have an internal skeleton, they have an exoskeleton. That exoskeleton is ideal for small creatures because uh, it, uh, it provides a lot of physical protection. You know, you, if you took a beetle, uh, six foot high my height and dropped it to the ground and would just shake it off and walk away. If you took me up to six foot high and dropped me to the ground, I'd probably sound like a bag of potato chips being dropped. So uh, the exoskeleton also provides waterproofing. When you're small, you have a lot of surface area for your body size. And if insects had skin like ours, which shed a lot of water vapor all the time, it would soon dehydrate. And so that's why things like uh, diatomaceous earth uh, uh, can work as a, a way to uh, dehydrate insects because it defeats the waterproofing on their exoskeleton. Insects, for the most part, are, are relatively small. It doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, nutrition to support them. Uh, <clears throat> they have the, the ability to fly, the reproductive capacity. Some of them are extremely uh, fecund. Uh, like uh, there are species of aphids that can have uh, up to 12 generations per year in the growing season. And, and, and at certain times uh, when they're reproducing asexually, they will be born pregnant. So it's ex extreme rates of reproduction, usually to survive extreme rates of predation. <clears throat> and then the other thing that's important for gardeners to keep in mind is insects relationship to plants. Uh, you know, they're not all enemies of plants, although most plants, they can have insects that have specialized to feed on them from the roots to their crown, you know, in any part in between. Uh, 
but there, it's also uh, one of the things about them is uh, their special relationship as far as pollination with uh, the flowering plants. So again, uh, that's part of why insects are so successful. Now, are all bugs evil? No, no. As I said before, uh, it's been estimated that of the species, uh, and we haven't even described them all, there's only about a tenth of a percent of them that are pests. And by pests, I mean things that uh, they uh, compete with us for our food crops, or they feed on us or our animals or livestock or pets. Uh, they uh, can destroy our structures such as termites or carpenter ants. Uh, so, but the vast majority are harmless or innocuous or beneficial. And the more you know about them, the less likely you are to, you know, see this this insect and go ah and and, and squash it unknowingly uh, because this is a scorpion fly and despite having uh, warning coloration aposomatic, this is a male it, and this structure is actually used for mating. Uh, they have small chewing mouth parts which they can utilize to. To feed on things like aphids, small soft bodied uh, insects and mites that are on the plants. Uh, and, and so in this case, it's beneficial. <clears throat> now, there are some insects that are definitely uh, uh, not uh, extremely beneficial, although, in a way, yellow jacket wasps, our native species, can be beneficial because they help control the populations of leaf feeding insects uh, because many of them. Uh, uh, during the summer, the, the workers are uh, predatory. And uh, so it, it all depends on, on what you're doing. If you, you have a nest that's causing you issues because they're very defensive and stinging you, then yeah, they're definitely a pest. Uh, this is uh, also a pest because it feeds on us, uh, the bed bugs. Uh, certainly, um, uh, this is human bed bugs. Uh, and uh, you'll notice I'm saying bed bugs. So there's two of them here. So this is the first instar out of the egg. The adults, when they're full of blood, are about the size of an apple seed. It, but when they're not full of blood, uh, they can fit anywhere where you can stick a credit card. So uh, they're very good at hiding. And as you can see here, uh, they're also, they start out very tiny. So that's probably uh, part of the reason why they're so easily transported around and why they've become so problematic uh, in recent years. <clears throat> When I do programs for children, I often ask them about, well, what's the most deadly animal out there in the world? And, you know, you get things, oh, grizzly bears or great white sharks. And, you no, know, you probably know where this is going. Uh, uh, mosquitoes, uh, adult female mosquitoes uh, spread uh, bloodborne diseases to humans uh, that kill two to three million people a year, estimated. They don't have a really good handle on that because a lot of it occurs in, in the third world and developing areas. And, and a lot of the mortality from things like malaria occurs in children under the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and often in those cultures, they know there's such a high mortality um, that you know, in, in some cases, you know, there's hardly any record keeping on it. It's just so expected. So again, um, mosquitoes have a major impact on us. Um, and we still, we have problems with disease uh, carrying mosquitoes in this country, that uh, West Nile virus, uh, Zika, and the areas, the warmer areas that had the, the species that can vector that disease. So, <clears throat> uh, but again, back to the beneficial parts of them, uh, the ecological functions of insects, the pollination. So again, uh, you can see here, this uh, bumble is just covered with pollen. And here it's packing uh, pollen back to uh, its nest on its, uh, uh, the structures on its hind legs that carries the pollen. So again, uh, very important for the, the flowering plants that require insect pollination. <coughs> The, but it's not just bees that do pollination service. Things like longhorn beetles can do that. Uh, there's flower longhorn beetles, a subfamily within uh, there that have uh, very hairy, hairy thoraxes. And the flowers that depend on them for pollination uh, usually have sacrificial bodies uh, that, that because beetles are a lot of times are called mess and soil pollinators. So they'll get in there and, and they're getting benefit because they're feeding on the sacrificial parts of the flowers, but they are transporting the pollen around as they move around. Uh, in alpine areas, it's often the uh, true flies, the dipterans, uh, like these this pair of uh, uh, narcissus flies that uh, do a lot of pollination. You can see pollen on their hairy bodies too. <laughs> 
decomposition in soil formation is a very important function of insects. Uh, you, you know, carrion beetles help to keep our environment clean by uh, removing uh, uh, dead animals from and recycling those nutrients. Uh, ants, when you think of the eon of time that ants have been aerating and moving soil particles around, they're very important for our soil formation. Uh, and they also, uh, in many cases, are moving um, uh, nutrients down into the soil profile too. So uh, again, very important. Uh, 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 in areas of grasslands that have large grazing animals, uh, dung beetles can be very important to help break up the manure that otherwise would uh, take much longer to decompose, uh, probably be a fungi to break down the cellulose. Uh, in this case, you know, they, they tear the dung apart and roll the balls off. Uh, in Wyoming, you know, we have these are tumblers, they're called uh, the species of dung beetles that roll balls away. But because of our dry climate, we have more that are called uh, dwellers or tunnelers. Uh, and, and what they do is some of them, they they maintain the crust on the pack to keep it from drying out so fast and they will form cavities in there and and lay an egg and some of them will uh, to uh, be more protected they will dig a hole directly underneath the pat and bury the, their ball of dung there and put their larva on it so that's that's how they work but again very important to uh, uh, grassland ecosystems <clears throat> Uh, critical links in the food chain. Uh, you know, there's the old saying, you know, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. Here's one where this uh, 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 hunting wasp has paralyzed the spider and she'll use it to provision a, a nest cell and she'll lay an egg on it. The uh, larva will hatch from the egg and will proceed to eat that spider, uh, the non-vital parts first. It keeps the food fresher that way. Uh, and, or in this case, here's a, a, a crab spider that hunts without a web. They hunt by ambush, uh, got this poor uh, honeybee uh, came to visit the flower. So again, uh, very important uh, in that. Uh, respect. <clears throat> uh, many other animals can depend on insects for at least part of their life cycle. So you know, many of our songbirds, or in the case, here's a sage grouse chick, uh, where uh, to fuel that explosive growth that, growth that many uh, birds have, uh, as nestlings, they they need the the protein and nutrition in insects. And here's a little lizard that's caught a grasshopper to eat. So again, uh, they they play an important part in our world. Uh, and is it hard to love a fly? Well, not really, as you learn more about them. So uh, my mom, when she was alive, she wouldn't wasn't a very big fan of insects, but she tolerated them uh, because uh, I I enjoyed them. And if she would have seen this, she was ooh, it's a big, ugly, hairy fly. You better kill it. But it's actually it's a tachinid fly, a family tachinidae, uh, and they are beneficial both as larvae and as adults. The adults feed on uh, nectar, and in the process, their hairy bodies help transport pollen back and forth between flowers, uh, and gives them the energy to seek out other insects on in which to lay their egg. And the egg will hatch, and the larvae will bore into that insect, whether it's a grasshopper or a caterpillar, uh, uh, things that usually feed feed on plants and, and then will eventually kill that uh, host. So again, uh, beneficial. Uh, robber fly is a generalist insect predator. So uh, again, they help keep nature in balance. <laughs> so really, you know, a rhetorical question here, can, we, can it survive without insects? Well, it certainly wouldn't be a very uh, pleasant world without insects because of the role they play in, in, in our environment and, and making everything function. So are there any questions about insects before we go on? <clears throat> this is just kind of a brief introduction. Hey Scott, just a quick question. Are you gonna talk at all about arachnids? No, no, uh, uh, other than, you know, how to distinguish them from uh, uh, insects because of their, you know, diagnostic characters. But no, this is all about uh, insects tonight. Okay, so I've got um, someone here that's got a question about a definite pronunciation of opal lions, false daddy long-legged, otherwise called harvestmen. Uh-huh. 
I think it's uh, the Opaliones is is a pronunciation. I'm a pretty poor one to to uh, ask about pronunciation. I can barely speak English. But uh, <laughs> uh, what do they want to know about the uh, uh, harvestman? Um, Tara, um, I've just you... wanted to know how to say that order. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I've, I've always struggled with how to pronounce it. So. You, you know, there are, uh, there's some uh, websites out there that can, uh, you know, sometimes I'm kind of doubtful about their pronunciation, uh, but uh, there are some out there that actually have like uh, audio recordings of pronunciations and you might check that out, uh, especially with the Latin and Latinized names, it can be difficult. Back when I was an, uh, an undergraduate, uh, I had a roommate who was a graduate student who had come to UW. His first degree was in like classical languages from some small liberal arts uh, college. And, and I was studying insects, of course, and I would run some of the names by him because they're uh, Latin or, or Greek based. And he'd say, that's not how you pronounce that. But that was how professors were pronouncing it. It became, it became accepted. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I guess the easy way to go about it is use harvestman. That's the preferred common name for them uh, because there's actually a true spider that is a, a daddy long leg spider. And, and harvestman only refers to the opleonis. Thanks, Scott. Sure. Uh oh, getting a preview. <laughs> I was checking my slides. Ah, no. Go up here. There's just too many buttons and controls for this simple bug guy. <laughs> I, I'm just a simple horticulturist. I, I relate. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, as I said tonight, it's it's really all about insects. You know, I'm in a way you're, we're trying to cram a semester course into a few hours because other subtopics such as immature insects or 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 other uh, you know say arachnology those types of things are a semester at least on their own. But tonight we're just going to concentrate on the major orders of insects of horticultural importance. So uh, this is really a, about um, a taxonomy uh, because, you know, for identification, we have to place them within their uh, classifications. And so uh, taxonomy is really just about that, how to organize things and, and helps us talk about it because uh, this way, uh, uh, say scientists, uh, another person who's studying uh, uh, orthoptera in, in Africa can ask me a question about locusta migratoria and I know immediately which grasshopper they're speaking about, whereas they, there might be multiple regional common names for it. And so uh, the other thing to keep in mind is you don't have to become a taxonomist to make correct, effective management identifications. Uh, uh, we are fortunate because uh, the insects that cause the most uh, economic harm, we know the most about because there's an incentive there for us to study and learn about them and, and be able to identify them. <clears throat> so uh, the basic organization is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And then the taxonomists have stuck a whole lot of subs and, and, and uh, 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 supers and, and, and sub families and all sorts of things in there that, but these are the basic ones. And so uh, the kingdom is, is animalia. We belong to that kingdom too, but immediately 
insects go into the phylum Arthropoda. And that's not a misspelling. It's actually an arthropod belongs to the phylum Arthropoda. Uh, same way with insect. Uh, insect belongs to the class Insecta. So uh, as I said, you'll see lots of pictures of grasshoppers. So in this particular instance, okay, it's kingdom is Animalia. It's an arthropod. It, it, it is an insect. It has the diagnostic characters, a head, thorax, abdomen, six legs, uh, and antenna. <clears throat> the uh, order that uh, the, the shape and form of these diagnostic characters puts it into its order. And that's very important in insects because there's so many of them uh, uh, being just able to place them in order is, is important. And then within that, all of the uh, uh, creatures that share these specific diagnostic characters that are grasshoppers, how we know them as uh, our shorthorn grasshoppers actually are critids, uh, belong to the family Acrididae. So all uh, insect families end in I-D-A-E, so Acrididae. Uh, the genus is Hesperitetix. So that's like our last names. Uh, it's always capitalized and either underlined or italicized. Uh, many times these are, are uh, Greek or Latin based. They're usually descriptive if you speak Greek or Latin. It, it helps me to learn some of these things that are uh, uh, the roots of these because it, it just clicks in my mind. And then the species is Viridus. So there's actually a, another a member of the genus in the state called uh, Hesperitetix speciosa. This is uh, actually, uh, uh, Catherine was talking about beneficial uh, grasshoppers. Uh, this is a snakeweed grasshopper and it specializes in eating the uh, uh, like broom snakeweed and a couple other species within that uh, Guderiza, I think a genus of, of uh, what are considered noxious weeds. <clears throat> so again, uh, you know, this is the basic organization and it works for everything. So it's important to learn. Uh, again, <clears throat> uh, order and family is very important uh, in the identification of insects. Uh, often family level ID can be sufficient for management. Say if you have aphids on your uh, uh, crop plants, uh, then that you can probably narrow it down and figure out what species it is. But the basic uh, control measures will probably be the same for aphids uh, on that crop. Uh, no matter which species it is. Uh, they often aren't that specific. <clears throat> Identification uh, reference books, they're all uh, organized around these classification levels. So it's good to know them. Sometimes to get past the, the family to the genus or species level, you need to have specialized taxonomic keys if they've been written or expert assistance, uh, you know, like sometimes uh, I get stuff that I am not familiar with. Uh, uh, there's just too many types of uh, or species of insects uh, uh, that in most cases, an entomologist really can only be super familiar with like one or two families. And, and so my family that I'm best with is Acrididae. <clears throat> The diagnostic characters, we already went over that. Three, bears, three pairs of legs as adults, three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. They can have either zero, one, or two pairs of wings as adults and one pair of antenna. Uh, and sometimes the antenna are very small. Sometimes they're large and ornate and easy to see. Uh, some insects, uh, they don't need uh, wings anymore. Uh, things like uh, fleas or bed bugs, they don't need it because they, uh, they don't need to fly anywhere to find their host. They generally live right in the vicinity, whether it's in a, a, their den or a nest or a cave or a house. <laughs> Okay, so here I'll show you the, the, the whole world of, of entomology is, you know, you've got rules of thumb, kind of basics, and then there's all these exceptions. So you take a look at this. This is an aphid, an adult. Uh, we, we call her an apterous uh, female, meaning she's wingless. And she's of the uh, stage of the life cycle where she's on her host plant and she's just producing clones of herself all the time. And if you just took a, a quick glance at her, what well, you think, well, that 
Well, it's kind of an insect. It's got six legs, but other diagnostic characters are missing. But you can actually, if you look closer, you see a head, a thorax. That's where all the leg bases originate from. And it has a large bulbous abdomen. Uh, this particular uh, stage of the insect uh, doesn't have wings. Uh, a lot of times uh, aphids, uh, people are often surprised at how complex the, the, their life cycle, full life cycles can be because they might have winter hosts and summer hosts. Uh, some of them will be um, uh, up in the, on the petioles of cottonwood trees at one stage forming a gall and then their next stage will be feeding on the roots of uh, sugar beets or other uh, plants in, in, in uh, the beta genus. So it's, uh, it's always uh, one of those things well, tonight we'll just concentrate on, on learning the basics and I'll try to show you uh, some of the things that we utilize uh, uh, to identify insects. So the mouth parts can be very important, especially for gardeners, because that way you can look at the insect and say, oh, I know what order that is. And, and they have piercing sucking mouth parts, but I'm having holes chewed in my leaves. So that's not the insects that's causing it. So that, that's where mouth parts can be very important to gardeners. Um, the antennae. Uh, their shape and form and length, uh, tarsi or feet of the insects, the number of segments, uh, wings, number and form, especially that uh, as we go along, you'll see that most of the order names are based on the wings. So mandibles, uh, sometimes they can be kind of hidden like uh, this is like an upper lip on an insect. And so this mandible here is folded out and they usually cross like that on insects. So they, you know, we go up and down, the insects go like that. <clears throat> uh, uh, some of them, you know, like this big uh, ground beetle uh, has really big mandible sticking out front because it uses it to grasp its prey. You have piercing sucking beaks that can be used either to feed on plants or other insects or sometimes uh, like bed bugs, uh, they feed on a blood of animals. <clears throat> a coiled proboscis, that's what uh, uh, moths and butterflies can have if they feed as adults. Uh, uh, there are many species that do not feed as adults. Uh, so they've lost those mouth parts. <clears throat> and then sponging mouth parts, this is like what house flies have so they it's kind of a modified piercing sucking but it doesn't what they do is they regurgitate digested juices on prospective food and then suck it back up and that's why they're really uh, uh, harmful and the, the, they can mechanically vector disease organisms the antennae um, so sometimes they're a little knob with a bristle or arista so that's where that aristate comes from filiform or thread-like, like a grasshopper often has. Uh, club, that's what butterflies have that helps distinguish them from say moths. Uh, so butterflies on the end of their antenna have these little clubs. There's also beetles that have that. Um, and then plumos or feather-like. So uh, uh, moths can have that and sometimes uh, beetles can have that. <laughs> Tarsi, as I said before, uh, can be important. In some cases, they give you a, a, a hint about the life cycle of the insect. So this is an aquatic beetle that spends most of its life swimming around, say, in a pond, and its hind tarsi have been modified for swimming. Uh, in contrast, here's a, a, like a, a June beetle, um, and it has uh, its tarsi are utilized for walking around on the soil and the plants, those types of things. Uh, you can see the segments. And, and the pattern of the segmentations on this particular uh, scarab beetle is a six, six, five. So uh, uh, their legs are set up like ours. So it's uh, uh, there's a femur and then the tibia coming off the body. And then all these segments, uh, the end uh, down here are tarsal segments and they go one, two, three, four, five. So, Cause sometimes they'll ask you, is this enlarged? Or uh, it, it, it looks like it's got, uh, you know, uh, it appears to be five, but there's actually a hidden sixth segment, those types of things. So you can see here, uh, sometimes you have to look at really fine details to help you identify. <clears throat> the other thing about insects is um, the diversity of their immature body forms compared to the adult forms. You know, we aren't gonna go into that because uh, uh, immature insects is really a, uh, uh, 
another semester long class in itself, but I will show you some of the ones for these common ones. You know, so things like a, a immature dragonfly, they live in the water. So their aquatic predators in the water look very different from the adult form. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just an example of how drastically different their lifestyle and uh, uh, body form can be between the immature and adult stage. <clears throat> now, Insects to go from uh, when they emerge from an egg uh, to adulthood, there's two basic paths to that. Uh, and simple or incomplete metamorphosis is one. And this is an example of the grasshoppers. This is another uh, nice scientific drawing done by uh, uh, Dr. Stump. And uh, so the insects, uh, this shows the complete life cycle of the big head grasshopper, one of the 120 some species that live here in Wyoming. They hatch out in the spring time and they have to molt in order to grow between these nymphal instars or stages. Uh, instar is the term they use for it for some reason. Um, they uh, So they have to shed that exoskeleton in order to get bigger. And uh, the way they generally do that is hanging upside down on vegetation and then they'll, they'll split the back of the old exoskeleton and crawl out and then expand their new exoskeleton and then there'll be like a chemical hardening process, and then they'll be ready to go. They usually, uh, uh, the grasshoppers we have take anywhere from five to 10 days to uh, go between stages. It kind of depends on whether it's early or late. And then when they do their final molt, they will get wings that have net-like venation. So until that time, they have little wing pads that uh, have these just straight vein uh, markings on them. When they get the functional wings, they will have net-like venation on them. So you can see here. And then the, they will mate and the females will lay egg pods and the egg pods are in the upper layer of the soil and that's what will overwinter. In contrast, we have complete metamorphosis. So you have an egg, it hatches out and the body form of the larvae are, is you know, often very simplified, uh, you know, uh, the say a caterpillar in this case is just an eating machine. I mean, essentially they uh, are uh, usually placed on the a suitable host plant by the adult and then they hatch out and their single job is to eat as much as, and as fast as they can in order to grow and get through this danger stage as being a larva. Uh, if it's a butterfly, the pupil form is called a chrysalis. If it, say it was a moth and it covered with silk, then it would be a cocoon. And then it undergoes this big uh, metamorphosis, you know, big change in form in the pupa and, and, and stage and emerges as an adult. And so in a way, a lot of times, uh, say a grasshopper, uh, immature and adult form, they compete with each other for their food. With uh, many of the insects that go through complete metamorphosis, there's no competition between the adult and larval form. So the larvae are plant feeders and the uh, adults uh, are often, you know, feed on some other stage, you know, like liquid, like nectar. So again, just, and then the cycle repeats. <laughs> So insects have a lot of diversity in their larva forms. So this is, you don't have to worry about uh, memorizing these things. It's just, it's easier to talk about them with uh, their uh, uh, stages. So this is vermiform. There's no legs, a worm-like grub. And so this is the immature of the emerald ash borer. You might've heard about this uh, particular insect. It It's beautiful, but it's devastating because this was an introduced uh, pest of ash uh, uh, that is now in the U.S. and is killing ash trees uh, because uh, the native ash don't, uh, number one, they don't have much resistance to it themselves and it's the uh, emerald ash borer is lacking uh, the predators and parasitoids that help suppress its population in the regions of um, uh, Europe and in Asia where it originated from. So uh, 
<clears throat> vermiform, not even a head capsule. That's what the housefly larva looks like or maggot. Um, these are not eyeballs looking at you. That's sphericals, which allow oxygen into the body because they're usually head first in food that they're liquefying and sucking up. They usually have little hooks that they can scrape on the um, uh, whatever or rotting organic matter that they're feeding on and then they ooze out digestive fluid and then suck it back up. <clears throat> and But very diverse, uh, uh, big difference between the larva form and the adult form. Vermiform with a head capsule, no legs still. Uh, fungus gnats is an example of that. So they have a little head capsule and little chewing mouth parts. They can chew on the uh, hyphae of uh, fungi, fungi and other uh, decomposing uh, organic matter like in uh, potted plants that uh, maybe have a little bit too much organic matter and a little bit too much water. Compodia form, legs well developed and mo mobile. So this is a larva form here that uh, this is uh, the seven spotted lady beetles larvae. It's surrounded by good food here. It's going to be happy. Uh, uh, they can search for food. Usually the adults place eggs where they know there's aphids are at. Scaraboform, they have legs, but have limited locomotion. So most of the time with scarab beetles, you know, they're kind of chewing their way through the soil and the roots of, of plants like turf grasses. Uh, and, and if you disturb them, you dig them out, they curl up in this really characteristic form here. So the tin line June beetle, and then that's its larval form or grub is uh, actual uh, an accepted term for the larvae of, of beetles. <laughs> A lateriform, and that it actually comes from the click beetle family, a latter a day. This is characteristic of them. Uh, they have a long, hardened cylindrical body with short legs, and they chew into uh, like fleshy roots. And so, in this case, this is the sugar beet wireworm larva. Uh, uh, so it's not. It's not a worm, and you often see that uh, if it's not, say, a true thing, you know, like. Um, 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 a dragonfly is not a true fly. It's written all in one word. Uh, same way with, the, in this case, a wireworm uh, is written all in one word, but it's really a beetle grub. So uh, the, this is an example of the adult and then the larva, very different. A rusiform. These are uh, the caterpillar larva forms. They have six thoracic legs, so that's what's going to be their uh, legs as adults, and that's up here at the head region, and then these legs here. They use those for manipulating food, and then they hang on to the vegetation with uh, abdominal prolegs that they'll lose when they go through complete metamorphosis. And on those prolegs, they have these crochets or hooks. So this is uh, how you can distinguish them from other similar uh, larval forms uh, by the presence of these crochets and then the number uh, of the uh, abdominal prolegs. So in this case, the black swallowtail, in most cases we think of butterflies as being, uh, you know, totally beneficial and, and very pretty. But if you're growing uh, things like carrots or parsley, uh, the black swallowtail larva can be uh, a pest of your crop. Saw flies, uh, they belong to the order uh, Hymenoptera. Uh, the, they are the, the plant feeding members of that order. Uh, the larva have six or more abdominal prolegs and there's no crochets on them. So you can see here, there's the head and then those are the thoracic legs. And then it has one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, at least seven uh, pairs of prolegs. And this is the uh, uh, pine sawfly. And they get that name sawfly as a, a general term because they, the females have a saw-like ovipositor and they have a habit of cutting into plant tissue to, to deposit their eggs. So in this case, she's cutting into a pine needle to lay the eggs. And then when those eggs hatch, they'll usually feed in mass. Sometimes they have big outbreaks of these, they, uh, like um, uh, the last time I saw a big outbreak was on the uh, training range at the uh, uh, Camp Guernsey, uh, uh, feeding on the, the uh, ponderosa pine there. <laughs> 
So let's take a quick break here uh, and, and uh, give everybody a chance to stand up and stretch and let my vocal cords cool off. Let's just take a, like a five minute stretch break. If you have any questions during that time, I can uh, try to answer them. But uh, I know how these Zoom meetings are, especially at the end of a long day. Uh, so it might be good to get up, do a few jumping jacks or deep knee bends or something, uh, grab a cup of coffee. I don't know, but uh, I thought I'd give you a little break. So we'll start back up at 6.50. Okay. And when we start back up, Scott, I got a couple calls, uh, questions for you. So um, get something okay. to drink and relax a little bit. Sounds good. You have a big class, 34. Yeah, you know, I put the I put this out to the graduated master gardeners that they can attend this. Then I send it to Goshen County and also to Platte County. So if their master gardeners want to watch this, they can. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so I, I open it up. You know, right now it's it's hard. It's hard to get your hours in and stay current. And I think this is a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> did you did you get a chance to look at the homework uh <laughs> I, I already got some questions on it so <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully they'll be able to answer it after i get done with my presentation so that's 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 my hope <laughs> yeah you can't really see the two what the two little pictures are uh is that the one on the simulated master gardener question well, that, that's that's why it's uh, it, it it reflects reality there. So you're lucky if you get one good picture out of three. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Hey, Catherine. Yes. So I watched one of those videos today from uh, January. Um, uh, there were three links that we could watch and it was the one about the caterpillars and um, bringing back biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Guy lives in Pennsylvania. That was some amazing stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think and if we leave in, nature help nature just a little bit by uh, not interfering uh, things come back yeah i took a biodiversity class at uw about 92 to 94 and i don't think they quit teaching it after that but it was a really good class i remember that that would have been uh dr jeff lockwood and dr scott shaw and uh, I actually taught sections of the biodiversity lab that they had with that class. So, yeah, unfortunately, it, it was a good class. There was a lot of student um, uh, participation and interest, um, but it got to the point where it, there was, um, you know, like my professors uh, uh, felt that the college should, should supply like a, a teaching assistantships to help with the uh, labs because they had research assistantships that they'd gotten other money for us to do that. And, and uh, it was one of those things uh, they said, well, we, you know, we don't need to teach it if you're not going to support it. 
and the guy said, okay. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was one of those things you got to watch out in a hostage situation. You got to make sure that the, uh, the uh, people you're talking to uh, care about the hostage because they didn't really care about the, the course or, or having good student numbers or anything like that. So, but yep, uh, it was a good course. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, uh, let's see, it's 651. We'll, we'll get back going. I just wanted to give you a quick break here. So like I said, I'm going to talk about just a small subsection of the uh, insect orders, um, the principal ones of horticultural importance. And this would be uh, uh, importance in the sense they can be pests or can be uh, beneficial. Uh, as I had stated before, the order names are translated um, usually uh, from like Greek. Uh, sometimes it's Latin based, but uh, <clears throat> you'll see often in these order names this uh, P T E R A, and that means wing. So that you know that just helps me uh, uh, keeping track you know, uh, as far as the different orders. Whoops! There we go. So the order orthoptera is straight wing, uh, and, and like I said, there's always exceptions with the insects. So immediately I show an angle wing Katie did, as and it's a member of the order orthoptera, uh, along with our, our snakeweed grasshopper. <clears throat> so, but it has other diagnostic characters of the order. So they have the enlarged jumping hind legs. Uh, they all have chewing mouth parts. Uh, the they. Um, you know, have this basic body form and they go, all of them go through simple metamorphosis. There we go. So the order orthoptera breaks down into two major suborders, the califera or shorthorn grasshoppers. And shorthorn just refers to their antenna being shorter than half their body length. Uh, so they can be small to big. Uh, this is a pygmy grasshopper. Uh, they are neat little critters. You usually find them around uh, like ponds or streams in mosses. Um, probably uh, the biggest I've ever seen is maybe a half inch long. Most of them as adults are three eighths of an inch long. And then you get others like this plains lubber. Uh, this is an adult. They have uh, their apterus as adults. They have, well, stubby wings. Actually, they do have some remnants of the wings, uh, but they can't fly. They're big. Uh, and, and you would think that they would be a great morsel for uh, other creatures to eat, but I think they taste really bad. So uh, they eat some uh, uh, pretty nasty weeds. And then you have ones that are pretty pestiferous. Uh, like this is a grasshopper in the order or in the genus Melanoplus. And uh, many of these uh, are can be extreme pests. Uh, part of it is due to their feeding preferences and part of it, uh, their ability to become uh, very numerous. They can be prolific egg layers and, and have uh, big outbreaks. <clears throat> Then you have others kind of in between. They may be specialists and feed on, you know, shrubbery or um, uh, grasses. Uh, some of them, uh, interesting uh, thing about these particular um, uh, creatures is that some of them overwinter as eggs in the ground. And that seems kind of, yeah, you know, that's pretty typical for insects. But there's actually some of these, uh, like this is uh, one of them, a part of the flora species that overwinter as a nymph and they spend the winter out on the prairie. And so I've seen the forecast uh, up to 24 below on Saturday night. Uh, so, or, or down, not up to, uh, and these insects can survive it. They have the strategies to uh, prevent the freezing damage where freezing is uh, ice crystal formation in their tissue. So their body temperatures will get extremely cold, but they won't suffer any permanent damage from it. And they'll become adults real early in the season. Uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, they're valuable uh, creatures for uh, the uh, migratory birds that come back early, like the mountain bluebirds, they depend on uh, some of the beetles and the overwintering grasshoppers uh, for the nutrition when they come back when, you know, like uh, the mountain bluebirds, usually I see the first one in March. So there's a lot of winter left in Wyoming at that time. <clears throat> um, uh, this also, the order of orthoptera includes uh, the longhorn members, uh, 
uh, things like the Jerusalem cricket, uh, mole cricket, and this is actually a, a Mormon cricket, but it's actually, a, it's a misnomer in two ways. It's, they're not Mormons and they're not crickets. They're actually a flightless Katie did. So this is the female. She has a sword-like ovipositor that she uses to uh, stick down into the ground and lay an egg. They can also be very uh, uh, prolific and, and damaging to crops. Uh, they are infamous because uh, and got the name Mormon crickets because of the damage they caused to the early Mormon settlers in the Salt Lake Valley. And, and again, uh, uh, the, these uh, creatures, um, it all depends on uh, how numerous they are and what they're feeding on, whether they can be uh, a pest or not. Orthoptera used to include the mantids, but now they've been given their own order, Mantodia. In, in Wyoming, uh, we actually only had two native species, relatively small, maybe an inch and a half long, that lived on the grasslands. Uh, <clears throat> now, I uh, probably in the past 12 years, uh, the European mantids. Uh, I mean, I find them in urban environments and out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they have uh, really established themselves in Wyoming. Uh, uh, in a way, you know, they don't really cause us any harm and they probably uh, in, in certain situations around your garden are probably doing you some good, but it also is an impact to the native biodiversity. I mean, they're, they're taking food that something else uh, that was native to the region would uh, otherwise do. So again, uh, kind of interesting there. Order Orthoptera used to include the walking sticks. They've been given their own order Phasmatodea. So these are, uh, there's probably more of them out there than we know. Uh, they're experts in camouflage. They have this stick-like body. They usually are associated with either shrubbery or up in the canopy of trees. And what little leaf feeding they do uh, is, I think, uh, not very harmful. I've never seen an outbreak of them or cause any damage, uh, but uh, they are interesting creatures when you encounter them. The order Dermaptera or skin wing, this uh, order, the entire order is given uh, a common name, earwigs. So again, our most common one that is problematic or a nuisance pest or can cause problems in gardens with feeding on uh, say forming fruit, uh, like an apple orchard and stuff like that is the European earwig. Uh, there's, this is the female, this is the male. Uh, you can distinguish them. Usually female insects are larger than males. And then in this case, the male has a different shape, pinching Circe. Now they, uh, I don't know, they're not, you know, they don't catch prey with those. Uh, it's kind of defensive. If you handle one, they'll try to pinch you with it, but it's not very strong. It can't pierce your skin. Um, it, it's also interesting, another case of, uh, you know, a problem pest that was accidentally introduced. It was thought that they were uh, brought into Seattle in 1907. At least that's when they were known, first known. And now 12 of the 20 species of earwigs that are in the U.S. were actually introduced from other regions. So again, <clears throat> kind of interesting. Uh, the order Thysanoptera. They're probably pretty numerous. Uh, we just generally don't pay them a lot of attention unless they are causing problems on our plants. Uh, the fringe wing or thrips uh, refers to the adult thrips have a feather-like wing. Uh, they're tiny. Most of them are uh, maybe a millimeter in length from head to tail and uh, millimeters about 1 25th of an inch. So, so very small. There are actually some of them that are beneficial. They can feed on the eggs of other insects or mites. Um, uh, they're usually boldly colored. <clears throat> uh, but an interesting thing about this uh, and also kind of shows that there's a lot we still have to learn about insects, ex especially the really small ones, is there's actually a small uh, parasitic uh, egg parasite wasp that uh, attacks the thrips eggs. So thrips lay a pretty big egg for the size, the small size they are. But this is uh, scaled to size, the electron micrographs of the uh, egg parasite wasp. And this is a paramecium. And then this is an amoeba. 
so how small those things are. So again, uh, it, it, they probably play a bigger role in what happens uh, to a thrips population, say in a crop or garden situation, than we know. Uh, you know, the, for the most part, they might keep thrips populations under control, but maybe something happens to them and the thrips escape control. Um, <clears throat> the the other thing here to, to show you uh, how tiny some of these insects are is uh, uh, the trichogramma uh, species of wasps. Uh, some of these are sold in places like Arbico Organics where you can release them uh, and they help uh, reduce populations of say pest species. Uh, in this case uh, Manduca which are the tomato hornworm and, and tobacco hornworm uh, uh, species of moths. So that that's the egg up here and from that egg emerge 28 species of trichogamma wasps. And then they'll go out after mating, the females will go out and lay their eggs inside other manduka eggs or other species of moths. So there's a dime, there's the moth egg, and then that's 28 wasps that emerge from that. So again, <clears throat> just a little bit of, uh, we, we know a lot more about the big insects than we do with the really tiny ones. The order Hemiptera refers to the true bugs. Uh, Hemiptera means half wing, and that refers to uh, many of the species having a two textured front wing, uh, a thickened leathery part and a membranous hind part, like our good friends, the box elder bugs. And you can kind of see here the whole uh, uh, development, the simple metamorphosis that they go through. So here's one that's uh, probably fairly newly hatched. And then subsequent to that, you have this, uh, you can stage them kind of by the development of their wing pads all the way to the adult form. You can see it here again with this, uh, uh, I think it's a uh, Korea uh, a type of uh, uh, true bug. I can't remember what I, where I stole that photo from, but again, that two textured hind wing. Uh, some of them are quite tiny, like minute pirate bugs, but they're very beneficial. Uh, they help control pests in your garden. Uh, they have a piercing sucking mouth part. That's one of their diagnostic characters. And they feed uh, uh, on fluids, whether it's the fluids of insects, uh, uh, plants, uh, like the box elder bug or uh, in the case of uh, uh, bed bugs, blood. So the Usually, the usually uh, the plant feeding ones have the first segment of their mouth part as it comes off the front of their head is attached to, for lack of a better term, their face, and then it's hinged and they can fold it out from the groove between their front legs to feed on plants. Uh, others uh, say like this uh, uh, kissing bug here, it has a, uh, a hinge at the front of its head and can unfold that and say grab uh, another insect or, or you know, uh, if, if it is a kissing bug, it might feed on a pack rat or a human or, or something else. So again, uh, the, that that's one way to do, distinguish them. It's important to be able to distinguish distinguish them because there's actually some of the uh, um, uh, true bugs that are beneficial and others that are big pests and they look very similar and so it's it, you need to look at them closely to, to, to distinguish them. The order Homoptera uh, has been moved into Hemiptera. Uh, uh, they didn't ask me when they did this because Homoptera was already big enough and Homoptera contains a whole lot of plant pests. They also have a piercing sucking beak. It attaches back to where the head joins the thorax. So here we're looking at the underside of a homopteran and there's the eyeballs and there's the front of its head and then its mouth parts back here. And then those are the, uh, the bases of its two front legs. So again, you can see here, uh, they have same wing. So their uh, front wing and hind wing are very similar in size and shape. That's where it comes from. <clears throat> they, they also go through simple metamorphosis. So this is a nymph of this particular leaf hopper. Um, <clears throat> There we go. Uh, feeding. So here shows an aphid. Uh, they have a relatively short beak and they're feeding on the plants. Uh, they can have complex life cycles with winged forms and different hosts. Uh, I've already mentioned that. So again, uh, a very important plant pest, uh, not only from the feeding damage that they can do, uh, but also through vectoring plant diseases. Uh, Homoptera includes the cicadas. 
I think it's this year there's one of the huge broods of the 17 year locusts will be emerging in uh, the New England area. Uh, and, and usually uh, it's kind of uh, a big event, uh, but not really enjoyable for people. It's more of a, a good b benefit for other wildlife because it's a food bonanza. So these uh, uh, particular species of cicadas will span uh, uh, most of their 17 year life cycle underneath the ground feeding on the roots of trees. And then uh, the different broods of these 17 year uh, uh, locusts will come out and some of them are quite small and some of them are huge and will cover a, a large geographic area and be very numerous. They get up in the trees and they're making noise. Uh, uh, the, the sound level can be over 100 decibels. So uh, kind of a, a spectacular thing, but I don't know if I'd want to try to sleep through it. <laughs> Uh, Homoptera includes white flies. If you uh, have a greenhouse, uh, usually in Wyoming, that's what it takes to get uh, uh, your humidity levels high enough to sustain these things. Um, they are small uh, and they feed with piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, they are, um, uh, can be a major pest in, especially in greenhouse. The order homoptera includes the scale insects. And so a lot of times with scale insects, uh, really the, it's only the very first stage out of the egg that looks like an insect at all that has you know, any diagnostic characters. So again, uh, so you have soft scales, which they feed on the phloem of plants uh, and, and produce honeydew. And often they can be uh, attended by ants that will suck up the honeydew and then provide them with protection. Uh, in the case of this is a brown on soft scale. And then you have the hard scales, which feed on different tissue. And in this case, uh, uh, they attach to an apple, essentially makes it unsellable if you were trying to grow apples for sale. Uh, the, uh, they secrete a hard waxy coating that provides them protection from like control measures and uh, predators and parasitoids and those types of things. So again, uh, this is uh, when they go to mate, the males will actually molt and come out from underneath their scales and they have the ability to move around. They look more like an insect then, but the females, once they've attached their mouth parts, they don't leave that particular position. Homoptera includes the mealybugs. Uh, we don't have a lot of those. Uh, they can be interior scape pests of plants. Uh, there's also um, uh, some that will attack things like the uh, broom grass that, uh, or brome grass that's grown uh, for um, uh, irrigated pastures and hay. Uh, and then there's the Hanchin barley mealybug that occasionally has outbreaks and can cause damage to uh, uh, barley crops in Wyoming. <coughs> Coleoptera. Uh, uh, this is uh, where this means sheath wing. And it's thought that Aristotle was actually the one that coined the, the name for this particular order of insects. It's the biggest order of insects. Uh, this is a picture from the insect gallery on the fourth floor of the uh, College of Ag building on UW campus. If you ever get a chance, you can stop by uh, in the future when uh, things are back uh, to a more normal. And you can see some of the, the neat displays. Now, most of these are tropical here, these larger uh, bupressed uh, uh, family beetles, but these two are actually from Wyoming. So we do have representatives that are, are actually beautiful uh, and, and, and uh, uh, same family as these tropical species. So the main beetle characters are chewing mouth parts, the mandibles. <clears throat> They all have that. The hard front wings have been modified into what are called elytra and they meet in a straight line. Now, many of the beetles have fully functional wings underneath that uh, and they just use that as protection over their body and they're folded up. Now, some of them, they've lost the ability to fly and they're fused. And then there is one large family called the rove beetles that have shortened wings and they actually have functional flight wings, but they're all tucked up under their like Irigami, you know, just really tightly folded and stuck under those uh, uh, shells. So there's that straight line. <clears throat> so now I just talked about that. What kind of mouth parts does this insect have? Well, I can't really hear uh, you folks, but uh, 
This is a, an example of a weevil. It's a type of beetle and it, it kind of looks like a beak, but it, it doesn't fold like say the true bugs have that folding beak. And the other thing, it's an extension of its face. And so its antennal bases are actually out here. And then on the very end of that are chewing mandibles. So they can chew into things. So this is European chestnut weevil. It can chew into a chestnut and then lay an egg in the hole that it's made with its long snout and chewing mandibles. <clears throat> so the order Lepidopter includes butterflies and moths and that refers to scale wing. The, uh, uh, this is what gives the color and pattern to their wings are these little tiny scales. The butterflies have uh, knobbed antenna and then not all moths are drab and and fly only at night. Uh, the uh, white line sphinx moth is one that uh, is pretty popular uh, with people because they, they're kind of like an insect hummingbird and they usually like to fly like uh, in the early mornings or in the evenings on campus at UW when their flowers uh, are in bloom in late summer and early fall there's usually lots of the uh, white line sphinx moths around. So again, there's scales on their wings. If you've ever handled a butterfly or a moth, you'll have that like dust come off in your hand. Those are the scales. So that's what it looks like in an electron micrograph, you know, like little, little plates. Neuroptera, the lace wings or nerve wing. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, one of the more common ones for gardeners to encounter are the green and brown lace wings. Uh, and then their larvae are, are spectacular looking like little crocodile shaped uh, critters that are great predators of other insects. And, and they're so predatory, it's thought that the adults uh, uh, have a, uh, evolved this, they, they lay the eggs on stalks and it's thought that protects the other eggs from the first one that hatches because they'd probably eat them. So in this case, then they can all crawl down and start dispersing uh, from the, where the adults lay the eggs. The order Diptera, these are the die is, is uh, two and two wings. And that refers to them having two functional front wings. And then their hind wings have been modified into these structures called halteres. So again, uh, the order Diptera, uh, lots of them uh, in very important order, uh, many of their pest flies. And of course the mosquitoes belong to this order. Uh, there's also some beneficial ones, uh, certainly the flower flies uh, that often mimic the coloration of wasps are, are very important because they, uh, they can provide um, uh, pollination services and their larvae are predatory on soft bodied insects such as aphids for the most part. Even some of the ones that we may not uh, like too much like blowflies uh, can be good pollinators. Uh, Hymenoptera, uh, membrane wing is what that refers to. So that's a big order, bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies. <clears throat> so the vast majority of Hymenopteran species are beneficial non-stinging wasps. Now these aphids would go, hey, that doesn't sound like a good name to me because what they're showing here are these aphidious species wasps are inserting eggs into these hapless aphids. And the larva will grow on the inside, eating the non-vital parts first, and then will eventually pupate within that body. They kind of puff them up and then they put a layer of silk on the inside, kind of makes them opaque. And if you're examining your plants like a good gardener should to catch pest problems early and you see aphids, you go, oh no, if you see mummies in there, that shows that you have uh, these uh, beneficial predatory wasps working on your uh, aphid population. You can't really have uh, uh, beneficials with zero tolerance for the pest. You know, they can't exist on, in, you know, nothing. So you, you got to have some tolerance. You don't want to let the pest get out of hand if they escape the pressure of these uh, parasitoids, but you, you can uh, uh, not worry about it too much if you see you have active predation going on or parasitism. And it, after they've completed their development, they use their little chewing mandibles and cut a little escape hatch from the body of the mummy. <laughs> uh, stinging wasps, they can either make covered nests 
or they can uh, make uncovered nests. Uh, they can be up in trees or under eaves. Uh, some species will be in the ground. Uh, they'll enlarge uh, like a rodent burrow and they can end up with very large nests under the ground. Uh, the Western yellow jacket is probably our, pro probably our most problematic uh, species uh, that causes stings. Uh, they're very aggressive and a lot of times their nests entrance are not very uh, noticeable until you mow over the top of them or walk uh, into them. Um, <clears throat> we also now have the European paper wasp it has finally showed up in the state and it is problematic. That's what these are. They're our only uh, paper wasp uh, well, only wasp species for that matter that has golden colored antenna. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, Professor Whitney Cranshaw down at CSU, he used to have a butterfly gardening uh, kind of program or, or information out there. He doesn't even promote that anymore because in the towns and cities in Colorado, the European paper wasp is so well established, they're pretty much a caterpillar vacuum. You know, they, they uh, are such efficient predators that they, besides sucking up things like cabbage whites, which we really don't care too much about, other uh, uh, butterflies, the fritillaries and other things that uh, you could grow uh, in your garden with the proper host plants, uh, they just get wiped out by these things. <clears throat> Hymenoptera includes the ants. So very uh, uh, numerous and interesting uh, social insect. Uh, you can see here, many of them have strong relationships with aphids. So that's what this ant here, she's tending these aphids and she can go up and she'll tap them with her elbowed antenna. All ants have very strongly elbowed antenna that helps distinguish them from other uh, uh, hymenopterans. Uh, and then a lot of times the aphids will squirt out some honeydew. And then you can see here, she's got a, a drop of honeydew. Uh, the other thing that helps distinguish the ants uh, uh, is the, um, this wasp waste. So on ants, they have a, a pedicel on there that can either have one humps or two, and that distinguishes their subfamily. Uh, uh, and then uh, other hymenopterans that have wasp waste, uh, such as you know this hunting wasp, they have a very narrow constriction between their thorax and their abdomen. So that's what that's what that always referred to as this narrow constriction. So you can see here these wasp waste. The other thing that helps you distinguish the hymenoptera from the diptera that can often have the, the markings, they mimic the stinging ability uh, or the warning coloration of the wasp, but the dipterans lack the stinging ability. And so um, the, the hymenoptera, the female can sting with a modified ovipositor, but they have actually four wings. So they have their front wing and then their hind wing is attached with little hooks. Uh, you can just barely make them out here and I'll show the outline. So, and if you don't look at them too closely, you'll say, oh, it must be a fly. Well, no, because there's actually four wings there. You can also see there's a lot of times there's a gap between the bases of the front and hind wings, but they act when they're flying as essentially one wing. So here's another hymenoptera, and then here's a, a, a dipteran that uh, mimics the coloration for protection. And, you, know, you see you have a large, thick joining between the abdomen and the thorax, and then only two wings. Sawfly, I already talked a little bit about that. They don't have a wasp waist, even though they're in the hymenoptera. They're thought to be the oldest members of the order, not thought to be, they are in the fossil record, they're, they're the oldest. And um, uh, they're the major direct plant feeders. They'll feed on leaf tissue as larva. Uh, some of them can be uh, quite uh, pestiferous on, on trees and shrubs. And many of the uh, males will have these plumos or feather-like antenna that helps them find the females from mating. <clears throat> so any type of plant pest management requires the ID of both the plant and the pest. Because uh, no matter if you're doing organic gardening or, or conventional gardening, uh, products require, you know, if you're going to follow the label, you got to know what plant you're, you're treating and what pest you're treating. And you need to be able to distinguish between friend and foe. So in this case, say you've got a zucchini squash plant out there and you see these insects and this is one, a squash bug that 
can cause damage to your plant. And then this is a, a predatory, uh, uh, sharp-shouldered uh, predatory stink bug. Then you, you need to be able to distinguish that. So one of the best references for identifying garden insects are either of these two books. Uh, this is the older book. I think it's print now. You can probably get it pretty cheap used. It is really good. It includes a plant pest index. The second edition came out a few years ago and uh, it's got another 600 uh, photos and they're really nice photos. Uh, really help illustrate, you know, they'll show the plant damage, they'll show eggs, they'll show the immature stages, the adult stages. Uh, uh, Professor Canshaw and David Shetler did a really nice job, but they ran out of time before they got the thing published. And that's why I sent you that Garden Insects of North America uh, plant pest index as a separate uh, document because Whitney was kind enough to, to provide that to me. So if you decide you want to get uh, a reference, uh, either one of these works. This one works really nicely with that reference. The only thing about it is it doesn't have the page numbers. You would have to look up on there, say, you know, okay, there's there's something feeding on my aspen. And then, so then you have to look, okay, aspen's under poplar. And then you look under poplar and then you can go there and, and figure out what it is. But you'll have to then look in the uh, general index in the Garden Insects of North America to uh, then get to the proper pages. It is also arranged for non-entomologists by the chapters because they have the different um, uh, uh, feeding uh, damage things that uh, the insects do. So there's uh, uh, like a chapter of insects that chew on leaves and needles, uh, insects associated with stems, twigs, shoots, and canes. So, so you get the drift. It's a great book, uh, really reasonably priced. I think there's some of them that are used for college classes. And so you can get on Amazon and you can get a used copy that was never opened. And um, it, it, it's a really great one. So normally what I do next is uh, teach you how to use a dichotomous key that was in the old Peterson's Field Guide. And it, it's a great old book, but it's getting kind of out of date. And now that we're doing things virtually, uh, I've, I've tried to modify uh, my, my talks and my education to match that. Uh, again, the Peterson Field Guide is amazing amount of information crammed into a little book for like 12, 13 bucks. Um, at that time, they had 26 orders. They've now expanded that. Like as I went through the talk, I gave you updates on what they've done uh, with some of the newer classifications, but it's still a good general reference, especially, um, uh, you know, like the throw in your backpack if you're going out for a hike or something like that. So let's see here. <clears throat> Where are we at on time? I guess we'll I'll go ahead and we'll get get you started so we can get you out of here. Uh, Catherine said I had until midnight. Is that correct? <laughs> 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 Let's see here. <clears throat> so I got another talk. I'm going to show you how to utilize a um, pictorial key. So. I can get to the right, right one. Here we go. All right. So, <clears throat> rather than using a dichotomous key, there has been uh, ways to, uh, or efforts to try to improve uh, those things for identifying unknown organisms, and. Uh, the interactive keys or sometimes called lucid keys because that was the first uh, software company that developed the uh, the app to do that uh, uh, is is really a neat thing and uh, I think it's probably going to be the wave of the future. <clears throat> um, you know we've already gone over some of this stuff about the basic uh, characters of insects you know to use an insect identification tool, you got to make sure that your creature is an insect. Um, and, and then uh, we've already gone over the basic classifications. Whoops. 
you know, there are multiple ways, you know, I, I got to admit, I've done flipping through the guidebooks. Uh, I often look at, I have all sorts of guidebooks. I didn't know I collected guidebooks until my sister said, you've got guidebooks for clouds and, and rocks. <laughs> so I, I, I got to admit, I, uh, I've done a lot of flipping through there. Uh, they also, uh, guidebooks can have thumb tab guides, pictorial tables of contents, um, the two, the dichotomous keys or two choice keys uh, are, are, are good, uh, but they can be problematic because if you run into a, a thing, say you're sent a photo and you can't see the part that's the next step in the key, you're stumped. Whereas with the interactive key that I'm gonna demonstrate for you, if you can't see a part, just ignore it. Go on and, and identify the other parts that you can see and it'll still probably get you to the right place. <clears throat> it's non-sequential. That's the thing I'm trying to say. And so what I'm going to do here is teach you how to use the uh, key to uh, insect orders that's at the Discover Life website, discoverlife.org. And then under there, they have a link to ID nature guides. And, and knowing how um, master gardeners like all sorts of things in nature, especially flowers and plants, you'll, you'll really like uh, finding this place if you don't already know about it. Um, uh, and what you'll do is you'll go to this link and then you can select the guide to the adult specimens of insect orders of the world. Uh, they have 31 uh, possible orders. <clears throat> and so they're up to date on their taxonomy. And this is what it looks like. <clears throat> like say, when you go to the nature guides, there's also things for wildflowers and you can actually go by region or even state and it'll, it'll break it down. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the, the uh, Discover Life website a lot. So here's what the one that looks, I gotta move this thing here. Let's see if I can get it out of the way. There we go. So I can see the entire thing. So here's what it looks like. <clears throat> so it gives you the instructions. It uh, has um, uh, all the orders listed initially as you start the process of identification. It uh, has basic questions and like say, well, I don't want to, you know, I can't really see the wings all that well, which would be a rare thing, but you can skip it. You don't have to start one, two, three, four. You can go down here and start looking at things, uh, say, well, wing development is absent and start there in the key. At any point in time, you can go search and it will eliminate these uh, possible orders as you go through. So uh, again, uh, it's, you can simplify, you can uncheck, you can go back, restart it. Uh, you can compare thumbnail images of the possible orders with your specimen. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is a, a demonstration of it. <clears throat> uh, the other thing too about it that's really great is you can um, uh, click on these images. They're clickable and they bring up uh, a magnified view and explain what you're looking at. So in this case here, you know, uh, this insect has two wings that are functional on the hind wings and the front wings have been reduced. Uh, so again, uh, you know, it's, it's really user friendly and you can do that for any of these uh, images within them. <clears throat> so we're gonna do a demonstration uh, say a friend of mine sent me a picture. What is this critter eating my pear? Now, <clears throat> some of you who maybe lived in other places than Wyoming would recognize this critter, but uh, many people in Wyoming don't. And so you, we can use the key. So let's start here with wing number. Well, we can see four wings. So there's one, two, three, four tips. They're kind of overlaying each other. So we can mark that. Uh, you know, if we go to wing shape, yeah, that's can't really tell too much about it. Let's skip that wing texture. Yeah, let's see, they are they look well developed and functional, so we'll go down here to that. Whoops. <clears throat> so then you can go well, wing venation or wing base, four legs. Um, Let's look at the forelegs. So, so they're not modified for grasping prey like a praying mantis. There's no swollen foretarsi. They're just regular old forelegs. 
hind legs, we can see here the hind legs are really good. They're, they're not like grasshopper legs. We could probably count the tiresome areas if it's a little bit more in focus, but let's just skip those. Let's go to the antenna, long thread-like antenna, filiform. So that's what that means. But like say, if you're confused by any of these terms, you can click on those, it'll give you more information. Uh, mouth parts. Well, obviously from the damage you've done to the pair, it has external chewing mandibles. So it's not a beak uh, and it's not mouthless. There's some things like uh, say bot flies, they don't have functional mouth parts. Their only job as adults is to find a new host to lay their eggs on. Um, uh, it, it doesn't have a proboscis. You know, those are the like butterflies and moths that feed on nectar. Uh, so again, uh, we'll keep going. Uh, I didn't talk about palps, but uh, they are structures that are kind of like tasters or whiskers besides the chewing mouth parts. So they're present right here. And each time you were clicking on these things, we're eliminating possible orders because not all orders have these same diagnostic characters. Body regions, we have a head, a thorax where the wings and the legs emerge and then you can see the segmented abdomen, broad and flattened is the body shape, the basic body plan here. Pronotum shape. Pronotum is this kind of a like a collar behind the head. So you can see here, you know, you could skip it and probably get to it, but you can see a really good view of it. So it looks like it's much better, completely almost covering the head. So it's almost like it protects the head from above. Abdominal base. It looks like it's broadly attached, not a wasp waist. Circe. Circe can be important because not all insects have it. So it can be absent, uh, elongate with more than two or short with one or two. So it's, these are the Circe. <clears throat> uh, it's uh, comparable to like on the earwigs, they have piercing Circe. <clears throat> so abdominal apex is the last character that we need to look at. Simple, without long filaments. So no, no long threads, uh, uh, no jumping organ, uh, no forceps like a, 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 a earwig has. So what our guide we've eliminated with all these choices tells us we have the order Blatteria, which are the cockroaches. And then you could click on that and learn more about them. So again, you know, the, it actually brings up this picture. So, <clears throat> whoops. There we go. So if you don't like this particular apps, there's other ones uh, like at bugguide.net. Um, it's also uh, great for other arthropods and immature uh, insects. This is what the bugguide.net uh, webpage looks like. <clears throat> it's, um, this is the clickable guide. So you kind of look just a generalized picture. It's not as nice as the Discover Life guide as far as detail, but this is a good one for non-insect arthropods. Uh, questions about utilizing this. This is what you'll need to use for your uh, first three questions of your uh, homework. So you can utilize the Discover Life Guide. If you, if you know what those things are, as you look at them, uh, you can go ahead and, and, and utilize the Discover Life Guide to make sure that it gets you to the right answer or double check yourself. Uh, the last one, uh, you'll need to utilize the Garden Insects of North America Plant Pest Index that I sent uh, to Catherine and she distributed to you. You can utilize that for your simulated master gardener. Uh, what is this uh, insect question? The other thing I wanted to share with you too that will be helpful in your career as a master gardener is the ability to take good photos and some of the tools that we have. Um, this is one that uh, Chris Hilgert was able to get uh, Master Gardener uh, offices. It's called a ProScope and it goes on to a, an iPad and it can take really nice uh, macro photos. Uh, this is an Aspen Tintiform uh, Leaf Miner adult. There are only about two and a half millimeters in length as adults. And so utilizing this, anything that you can fit under this. So about a dime size uh, uh, creature, you can really get uh, a fine scale detail. You know, shows the long thread-like antenna, 
the scales that place it to its order of, of Lepidoptera. Uh, the other features, you know, you can then, you, if you know what the host was, that will really help you figure out what it is. But again, this is a tool that's available. Uh, the other thing, um, click on here. <clears throat> the other thing that's a really good tool is Oops. Well, I don't know if I wanted to do that, but it's a smartphone. Can everybody see a smartphone? So I've got it on my fancy tripod, which is a coffee mug. And And you can put <clears throat> put yours, and it's really nice as far as uh, the latest update on the magnifier mode is made it easier. You can get pictures. Um, I like to have something in there with a scale of reference for size. Uh, I also kind of like to have a neutral color, not bright white, because that can kind of overwhelm your cam camera sometimes. You want to. take it in good light if you can uh, you know that's all about taking a good photo am i still on Catherine? looks like my screen's frozen <laughs> you're kind of cutting in and out scott Catherine, are you there? Yep. I, I can hear you. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I can't see anybody now. Let me see <clears throat> if I can get it back. Okay. I don't know what happened. Yeah, you are frozen now. Darn it. Huh. Where did it cut out on, Catherine? Did it cut out when I was trying to demonstrate the... Uh, Um, uh, showing the pictures of the yeah Scott you're still cutting in and out um I don't know if it's a bandwidth problem on, on our side or or not. Um, Scott, you may want to just try logging off and then coming back onto the program. Catherine, can you hear us? Wow. Your sound. Go back to mute. I, I've never had that kind of problem with uh, Zoom before, so that's interesting. I have all my superfluous technology on uh, airplane mode, so it doesn't pick up any Wi Fi or check out bandwidth. That always helps. And hopefully Scott can get his program to come back on. I'm waiting for him to rejoin us. So in the meantime, this is a great opportunity to take a break. <laughs> Is scale what I see on my peony blooms with the ants trying to eat it? So on your peony blooms, the peonies exude a sugar and they are deliberately attracting ants 
to come get that sugar. And it's a defense mechanism that the peony bush has evolved into. So it's, don't try to kill the ants. Don't, don't dust it, spray it, nothing. Just, it's just a symbiotic relationship between the peony bloom and ants. Okay. It's just kind of a weird thing with nature. Okay, Scott said that uh, he just shut his computer down, got it restarted, and they'll be back shortly. So <laughs> go take a break. Yeah.
Thanks. Oh, the joy of computers. <laughs> You're back. I have no idea. I, uh, I had re it restarted on its own, and uh, then it took forever to load Outlook again to get back so I could get the link to come back to the meeting. <laughs> so we, you had a break. Uh, <clears throat> um, where did it cut off, Catherine? Did it show the uh, iPad with the Proscope on it and stuff? That's about where we left off. Was okay. Just starting with that one. I mean, it looks like your first slide with that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is the ability of uh, your smartphones to take really good pictures, you know? And so uh, like any pictures, having good lighting, uh, a nice neutral background. I like to use anything from like a empty old um, uh, uh, peanut butter plastic jar as a tripod or a coffee mug works pretty well. It kind of depends on your phone to get the, uh, the right height and then that really steadies it. And then um, I turn on the magnifier app because there's some nice features in there for capturing uh, images or looking at close uh, uh, views of the insect or other arthropod that you're examining. Um, so that that was the basis of it. Essentially, I, I just wanted to share with you that there are some nice tools now to take good photos. Uh, that's when I, I don't know if you've all looked at the homework assignment that I sent you uh, is kind of tongue in cheek there. You know, this is kind of typical of a master gardener uh, query via uh, photos uh, is that, uh, you know, you might get uh, somebody asking, what the heck is this thing? And you get a blurry photo from five feet away of a small insect. Uh, so that's uh, why I only gave you one good photo of the uh, problem in your homework. So uh, good photos, you know, yep. you can't do anything without a focus. If it's too dim, you can adjust contrast and lighting. Uh, <clears throat> But um, I think what I'll do next is uh, I was just going to give you something that's really handy for uh, uh, gardeners, and, and that's a topic of uh, uh, arthropod plant damage. And so let me share my screen, and we'll do that to wrap up the evening. <clears throat> so that there, minimize. So you, you notice that I used arthropod, not just insect, because uh, uh, there are some other uh, creatures that can cause plant problems as illustrated here on this first slide. Uh, this is um, uh, damage on an aspen leaf caused by an eriophyid mite, a very, very tiny species of mite that uh, generally you identify them by the uh, plant and then the form of the gall that they make. So uh, it's a, there's a good old uh, USDA publication that has some nice color plates. It's uh, very useful. Uh, I'll send that also to Catherine. I uh, forgot to include the reference book list that I generally provide to um, master gardener students because that's really key is having good reference material. Uh, nobody can remember it all, but uh, if you've got the reference material, I know it, I've already talked about this because the insect mouth parts are very important for identification to um, their correct order. It's also very important for determining uh, the type of plant damage that they can inflict or if they can inflict plant damage at all. So uh, <clears throat> you have the basic chewing uh, type feeding damage that uh, you know all beetles have chewing mouth parts uh, both in the larval stage or grub stage or in the adult stage. So Colorado potato beetle and then these are the grubs. Very obvious, you know, chump chump and, and they're removing leaf material. <clears throat> uh, 
sometimes it's very characteristic on where uh, they do it and how they do it. And sometimes it's not very apparent because a lot of the root weevils, whether it's the black vine weevil or the lilac root weevil, rough uh, uh, strawberry root weevil, uh, those are um, nocturnal. Uh, they uh, uh, have their front wings are fused, but they still have a straight line down their back. So they are a beetle, uh, <clears throat> but they make very characteristic notching, but they do it at night. And so sometimes it's not very apparent. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, they're a type of broad nose weevil. So they're not as extreme as like say that chestnut weevil that I showed you where it has a very elongated face with the small chewing mouth parts. They have a, a, a shortened broad face, but their antenna bases are out there. <clears throat> their larvae are actually the more serious pest because the adults are chewing on expendable leaf tissue. You know, they, certainly, and they're chewing on the edges. So they're not you know, chewing on the, the stem and then causing the entire leaf to die, but they lay eggs and then the eggs hatch and will spend the majority of their life feeding on the surface of the roots and can be very serious pest and really uh, uh, hard to establish uh, new plants or new transplants in areas, say you've got a lilac hedge that's just infested with these things and you put a new uh, shrub or tree next to it that's susceptible to these and it, it can be really hard to get them established. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I got uh, the uh, lilac root weevil with a lilac transplant in my yard and I've never been able to eliminate them. I live in a fairly isolated area. Uh, but I have found things that they don't seem to damage too much. They have a very broad host range. That's the other thing that's key with insects is a lot of times, if you know what the plant is, you can really narrow down the possible pests. Uh, leaf cutter bees generally give them a pass because you know they they do some damage on the leaves uh, can be fairly extensive. It's thought that most plants, if they're otherwise healthy, can lose about 50% of their leaf surface uh, in and not be uh, significantly harmed. Uh, <clears throat> leaf cutter bees they're not eating that leaf tissue. Uh, they're using it to make little chambers, which they will provision with a ball of pollen and nectar, and then lay their egg on it. The female will so she. She makes the sides of the chambers with ovals and then she caps them with the little perfect circles. And so, you know, they land on there, they use their little sharp mandibles and chomp out the leaf and fly off with it. And they like uh, holes or, or cracks. Uh, I, I remember one time I had uh, somebody who was they were working on their shake shingled roof and they found a whole bunch of these things that they thought were like the stubs of little cigars that had been shoved up under the, the cracks and crevices of their shingle roof. Skeletonizing leaf feeding. And that's where I call them the picky eaters of the leaf or the insect world. So they're eating the timber uh, juicy parts in between the leaf veins. Uh, alfalfa weevil is uh, uh, one of those that does that. The larva uh, skeletonizes the leaves of the alfalfa plants. Uh, there's other, uh, many of the leaf feeding beetles um, uh, will do this. Heavy feeding damage uh, can occur and not just on the leaves. So in this case, if you were growing uh, corn for say a farmer's market, uh, these grasshoppers uh, you know, would make these unsaleable for you. And they're, so they're not chewing just on the leaf surface. They found the, the developing seeds are really good food too. <clears throat> Fouling and shot holes. Uh, so in this case, these are climbing cutworms and they're up on uh, this corn stalk and uh, they uh, are eating machines. And so they produce a lot of uh, frass and feces and, and uh, that accumulates on the stalk. And um, you sometimes have this occur where uh, there are species that can be nocturnal. So you don't see the insect actually, but you see all this uh, 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 frass on the plant. Uh, you also have uh, borers uh, that chew their way into a plant. And so in the case of this uh, European corn borer entry holes, as the leaves unfurl, as the plant grows, you see all these holes that looks like uh, somebody's poked with an ice pick, but they're chewing their way into to get inside the stem. <clears throat> Uh, leaf surface feeding damage, where they don't chew all the way through. They only chew either from the bottom up, say in the case of the Mexican bean beetle larva, or from the top down in the case of, say, cabbage whites. And in our dry climate, a lot of times that leaf surface that's left behind will dry and crack and flake out and will kind of look like 
entire uh, feeding, but it, it is actually a surface feeding. <clears throat> yeah, there's the Mexican bean beetle. This is when you're out inspecting your garden. You know, that's why you want to look not just at the top of the leaves, but also underneath, because in the case of the Mexican bean beetles, that's where they hang out is uh, they're kind of protected under there. So uh, they are the black sheep of the lady beetle family. You know, most of the time gardeners have a very high opinion of lady beetles, but uh, this, uh, this insect is in the same family, uh, the coccinellidae, as our lady beetles. <clears throat> Defoliation and silk tinting. Uh, that can be, uh, uh, you know, diagnostic for some of our pests like western tent caterpillars that uh, will, uh, after the eggs hatch in the spring, uh, they kind of feed communally and make a silk nest to, sh to shelter in during the day. Uh, helps discourage predators and parasitoids. This is what the adults look like. A lot of times you don't see these. Uh, they're mainly nocturnal flyers <clears throat> and they make uh, uh, they luckily they are natives and there are uh, many predators and parasitoids of them, but they do have outbreaks occasionally and uh, they can cause defoliation. It's usually uh, not that harmful if the plants don't have other stresses and it doesn't occur year after year because uh, uh, most plants can put on a new set of leaves. Uh, they'll be smaller and it is a, it does cost the plant uh, energy resources. But uh, again, this is, is a difference between uh, a native insect uh, where the plants are adapted to it. Uh, in the case, you know, I talked a lot about tonight of uh, insects that came from other parts of the world in here and cause a problem. This, the opposite has occurred too. Uh, so uh, they call the, um, uh, in China, they have what they call the American white uh, uh, caterpillar butterfly, I think, or no, what do they call it? I think it's the American white uh, caterpillar. And it, it is a species that came from North America that's causing problems over there and therefore so <clears throat> plant tissue damage discoloration. So thrips, they scrape on the plant surface and then suck up the juices. And so uh, because they're tiny, uh, you know, often see them actually causing the damage, you're more likely to see the aftermath, whether it's on the plant leaf tissue or on the flower petals. Uh, <clears throat> so again, the other thing that you'll see as a result of uh, thrips feeding is a black tarry like substance. Uh, their their frass uh, is left behind on the leaf. You can also get the damage and discoloration and have silk present. And so these can be uh, spider mites. And, and you know, if they're feeding on the leaf, that's bad enough. But if they're feeding on your strawberries and causing this uh, malformation and damage, you know, that, that's not going to make me too happy. But uh, the, uh, uh, at high populations, you can just barely make out the spider mites down here. But the silk is pretty easy to see. And you'll notice the discoloration. So these are the eggs. So they, the females lay a relatively large size eggs. Uh, this is where uh, things like the minute pirate bugs or the predatory thrips can be an aid in suppressing the populations of spider mites. And sometimes as the result of say you do an insect decide application and it has an impact on those beneficial insects, you can have spider mite flares. So uh, this is frequently in the case uh, with the uh, usage of um, uh, the old insecticide called carbaryl or uh, often sold as seven, although they've reformulated or uh, seven nowadays does not mean that it has carbaryl in it, but uh, that was one where uh, the carbaryl had no effect on spider mites, but it did kill their uh, uh, predators. And so you could have a flare up after you'd treated with carbaryl. Leaf curling and, and uh, uh, is something that can be done by aphids or thrips or plant mites. And they do this with an injection of uh, chemicals that modify the leaves as they feed on them. And it's really clever in a way, you know, creates a structure that physically protects them. Uh, and, and yet they can feed, continue to feed on the inside of it. So uh, it makes it very difficult to apply anything, you know, whether it's insecticidal soap or, or anything like that, that has to be physically applied to the pest to be effective. It's uh, good protection. <clears throat> The piercing and sucking uh, uh, beaks that can feed on the uh, cell contents um, uh, can be done by the true bugs, the order Hemiptera. 
uh, things uh, such as uh, the stink bugs. There, some of those are can be predatory and beneficial. Others are not. This is one that I hope we don't get in Wyoming. Uh, this is the brown marmorated stink bug, another introduced pest species that feeds on a lot of different uh, valuable um, uh, plants and causes damage uh, many different crops. Uh, again, other things, you know, these uh, aracis uh, uh, species, um, uh, like false chinch bugs, uh, Nicea species uh, that can be clumped into that terminology of false chinch bugs. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're being, um, you know, innocuous. They're just feeding on things like mustards, but then they can move in and feed on other uh, plants in your garden, or uh, in some cases, they're a real big nuisance. So try to get in houses and cause uh, issues there. <laughs> Uh, the piercing sucking uh, beak uh, can be flow on feeders where they produce um, uh, the honeydew because they're consuming a lot of that uh, uh, liquid from the plant and to get enough nutrients they have to consume a lot and then they exude that sticky uh, 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 sugar rich fluid and uh, in the process that that uh, honeydew can form sooty mold. Uh, the feeding can cause moisture stress and <clears throat> they can be serious uh, plant disease vectors. This is one where the glassy wing sharpshooter is an, a native to North America, but it was native to the southeastern North America and fed on uh, native grape species down there. And it uh, vectors a disease called Pierce's disease. Well, European grapevine uh, varieties uh, uh, have no resistance to it. And unfortunately, uh, the glass wing sharpshooter was accidentally uh, relocated to California and is causing uh, problems out there in the wine industry. So they're called sharpshooters because they're when their single defense besides you know, flying away is they'll shoot a drop of honeydew out of their butt at uh, say a predator uh, and you know that sticky liquid either distracts them uh, enough to get away from them but th that's why they're called sharpshooters. <laughs> Uh, hard scale insects. Uh, so the, uh, we already talked a little bit about that. The females permanently attach to the plant in, with a, you know, kind of a thread-like um, piercing sucking mouth part. And then they feed on the plant cell contents, but they don't produce any honeydew. So again, uh, not a great picture here. That's the scale. Uh, there's the, um, where the insect initially attached and then it's expanded this scale in concentric kind of growth rings almost and it's hollow underneath and that's where she'll produce her eggs and, and the eggs will spend the winter under there and then in spring they'll hatch and these crawlers will then disperse on the that plant and some will walk to the edge of the plant and just let go and they're so tiny they'll disperse with air currents and so that's how they can redistribute in the environment. Uh, things like oyster shell scale has a very broad host range and uh, they, they may have good fortune and find another suitable host plant. Uh, others will probably die. This is one of the more common scale insects we have, and it's usually on things like uh, Cotonia aster or um, aspen, and they can be serious pests uh, of those particular plants. <clears throat> so that's what the adult male looks like, and then that's what the female looks like. So those are those kind of waxy concentric uh, ex extrusions that she makes to make a hollow cavity to put her eggs under. <clears throat> Soft scales, they feed on that phloem again and they produce honeydew and cottony maple scale, it affects a lot more uh, varieties of plants than in maple. So uh, like I say, the common names don't always, they're not always accurate. Uh, you need to identify it and figure out what they are. So that, that cottony mass is full of uh, their eggs. Uh, striped pine scale, a lot of times, these are really good camouflage. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I had a guy, he came and got me one time on campus. He says, what are these wasps doing? And uh, the yellow jacket wasps in the fall were visiting these striped pine scales and feeding on the honeydew that they were producing. I'd walk by that pine tree, I don't know how many times, and I didn't know that there were striped pine scales on it until the wasps showed them to me. So it's, it is kind of interesting. They feed on phloem. The leaf mining damage, um, some beetles, moths, wasps, true flies do that. So they feed in between the upper and lower surfaces. And you can kind of see here, 
uh, the paths where, uh, say, the adult insect had inserted them. Uh, and then as they feed, the tunnels get bigger and bigger. Uh, they are, uh, uh, most of them are flattened dorsal ventrally uh, uh, to fit in that habitat as larvae. And then when they become adults, say uh, like this uh, uh, type, of, type of true fly that's a leaf miner, I think that's the spinach leaf miner uh, fly, they look normal. So a very interesting adaptation between uh, their, their larval uh, form and habitat and the adult. There's also arthropod caused plant calls. And some of those are very interesting uh, things that uh, uh, will you know, modify the plant tissue to make a home and protective shelter for uh, the, the insect or uh, mite that can do these things. Uh, this is my favorite. This is the wool sower gall maker. I, it looks like something Dr. Seuss came up with. So very cool thing. Uh, again, um, in most cases, fortunately, galls, uh, they, they do steal some of the plant's resources, but they generally are not plant killers. Uh, is, you know, there, are, there can be treatments for them, but it's usually very difficult because they are in the interior of the plant and you may have to use a systemic. And uh, in many cases, because they're not a serious economic issue, uh, there are no products registered for that use. <clears throat> Galls on ornamental uh, uh, plant leaves are usually not a major problem. I mean, that's, that's disposable tissue. Yeah, they're hijacking some of that that could be uh, producing uh, you know, carbohydrates for the plant, but it's... Uh, uh, you know, these are aerified uh, mites uh, with that um, uh, proscope on the iPad at the highest magnification, you can just make out those mites. They're tiny carrot shaped things. In uh, um, those particular mites as adults only have four legs and, and can barely move around, but kind of interesting. Spittle bugs sometimes show up and the, these are nymphs of a, a hemipteran and they uh, will uh, create these uh, uh, balls of mucus in which to feed in and it provides them shelter from predation. So it's kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, unsightly, but you can get rid of them with a hose. Stem bores. <clears throat> these are very serious pests <clears throat> because they're attacking a long-term tissue such as the interior of a tree uh, branches or, or, or leaders, uh, which then will collapse in windstorms or uh, be on the inside of, a, so this is a, a ear of corn, so a European corn borer got up in there and it's feeding damage there will reduce the yield on the corn. Or um, this is a, a kind of a resurgent pest, a rose stem girdler. Uh, it, it's been causing some issues with people trying to grow uh, Red, red raspberries, which are related to roses. And so that's why they, they can, uh, so the, the girdler, uh, they lay their eggs on there, the eggs hatch, chew under the bark, and then they spiral uh, underneath the, the bark of that cane. And then they get inside the pith of the cane and go down there. And then that's where they'll overwinter. So again, uh, pretty serious pest because they've killed that cane above they, by girdling that tissue. White pine weevil damage. So this is a, a beetle that does this. And in the damage is more apparent uh, from the characteristic shepherd's crook that uh, it makes on uh, the infested pine. So if you were growing a Christmas tree plantation, this would be a very serious pest to have. This is what the little weevil looks like, the little adult weevil. Their larva is what's doing this by feeding on the interior of these shoots. <laughs> Emerald ash borer, I talked a little bit about that just a gorgeous metallic insect, uh, uh, purple underneath. Uh, they think that, that uh, they make uh, uh, monitoring traps with that purple color because the females will flesh that and the males are attracted. And this is a way to, to d determine uh, the distribution of the emerald ash borer in, in areas with these monitoring traps. But um, very serious past uh, threat to our native ash trees. Uh, the larva feed under the bark and, and essentially destroy that cambium layer. 
we also have things like Asian longhorn beetle uh, that's introduced to the US. Uh, <clears throat> it, it is one of the few things that we've had some success in containing and even eradication in, in one or two infested areas. Um, uh, large, uh, spectacular longhorn beetle, um, but the larva chew inside the trunks of uh, trees. They prefer maple, but they can attack these others. And we do have one native maple in Wyoming. That's why they distributed the box elder is uh, in that genus, Acer. So certainly, hopefully we can get them contained and, and, and uh, under control and not have them spread like the emerald ash borer is. Horntails, they usually get those uh, submitted, especially this year when we had the uh, murder hornets uh, were all big in the news. Uh, they kind of look like a murder hornet and uh, they really are not, a tree killer. They are. Uh, they take advantage of a dead or dying tree, and they use this horn-like ovipositor. The females do to lay their egg, and then the larvae chew on the, the kind of dead and deca decaying wood while it's still relatively fresh. Uh, so, a kind of a, a interesting creature, uh, relatively harmless. And then there's really a cool. A uh, type of uh, parasitoid uh, wasp, a giant ichnemon that goes after them and, and puts its long ovipositor down through the wood into the chamber and will then uh, inject its larva into the larva of the pigeon tremex or horn tailed wasp. Bark beetles, uh, there's many species of bark beetles. And of course, uh, the ones that like the mountain pine beetle that uh, cause a lot of tree death in our, our uh, Rocky Mountain. So uh, definitely uh, bark beetles are important, still important pest in our uh, urban areas too. Uh, one of the more common things that kills the tops of uh, big uh, spruces in, in urban areas is uh, Ips beetles. And that's probably the tops are, are more water stressed than the lower portions usually. And of course, in some areas, uh, you know, in some years, uh, the entire spruce tree is pretty water stressed by the time summer comes around. And, and certainly um, the bark beetles, very important. They make these characteristic um, uh, galleries underneath the, the bark in the cambium layer. And then the females will lay their eggs uh, and then the larva hatch in girdle the tree. They also introduce a, a, a symbiotic fungi uh, and that's the blue stain fungi and it helps clog up the tree's defense and it actually also makes the, uh, the, uh, the cambium in the wood more nutritious by the and, and so a really close relationship, the, the beetles actually have structures on their exoskeleton called mycangia. So when the young beetles uh, uh, go to emerge from the bark of the tree, they will, they will be carrying the spores that uh, will in, uh, infest the, the new tree and, and help their young um, in the next generation. So uh, there's some really good books out there. Uh, one of the best, the Insects and Diseases of Woody Plants in Colorado. This is a, a, a redo of an older one, which was uh, uh, Insects and Diseases of Woody Plants in the Central Rockies. But uh, Whitney and his uh, compatriots, uh, they updated it a few years ago. I think it's about 40 bucks shipped from the CSU Bulletin Room. This field guide to diseases and insects of the Rocky Mountain is also an excellent uh, guide. It is uh, out of print now, but it's available as a PDF document and can be downloaded and printed yourself. Um, in both of these books have uh, plant pest guides uh, and are, are really um, a great reference book to have. If you don't have it, you can probably also maybe find them uh, used. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so uh, Normally, I guess if we have, uh, had more interaction, I could uh, have this quiz, but I usually put this up after this, you know, because here we have a little grasshopper. They have a chewing mouth part. Here we have a true bug. You can actually see its beak here. Uh, this is on a crested wheat grass. Uh, no, I think intermediate wheat grass over here. Uh, both of those are suitable hosts for these insects, but one of these is causing this model damage where they've sucked all the green cell contents out. So it would be the true bug because they have a piercing sucking mouth part. <laughs> With that, I think that's about all. I, if you have any questions, uh, the only other thing I'd probably wanna uh, let you know about, 
I will send Catherine uh, the reference list, but this is a great old book. There we go. Test of the West by Whitney Cranshaw. Um, it, it's a really kind of good generalized reference to have on common garden crops in our area and the pests uh, that uh, they you can run into. And it has, you know, whether it's uh, uh, cultural control or organic control, uh, physical control, um, you know, some of the basic steps that you can do to try to deal with the pests. So, um, yep, if you, anybody has questions on chat or if you want to unmute and ask me, I will be happy to try to answer it. Okay, so this is this is your great opportunity to ask um, Scott a sort of insect good bad question. And again, um, go ahead and unmute yourself if you want, or you can type your question into chat. You mentioned the word parasitoid a couple times. How is that different than a parasite? What does that mean? Okay, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I should have explained that uh, uh, a parasite lives at the expense of its host. A parasitoid will eventually kill its host. So that's what they uh, have uh, termed uh, many of the, um, uh, the hymenopterans, the little wasps that attack the insects because they will uh, eventually kill their host. They, you know, they'll eat the non-vital parts first and then you know, when they've completed their development, will go ahead and, and kill the host and then emerge. Or in the case on some of them, like with the caterpillars, uh, they might even, not even bother really finishing off their host. They'll just, oh, we're done feeding and they'll come out and we'll either pupate on the exterior of the caterpillars. You've maybe seen pictures of say like a big green tomato hornworm just covered with white silky cocoons. So Scott, to help everyone kind of wrap their head around what you're saying, uh, wasn't there a very well-known movie made on that whole premise? <laughs> uh there probably was actually yeah when you think about it yeah aliens is is uh very much like a, a parasitoid you know it's inside the the person and then bursts out and and starts the whole process over so yeah when you think about it many of the science fiction movies that all they did i'm, I'm certain the writers were familiar with some of the stuff that insects do Yeah. Let's see, there's a question. Uh, can we get access to your slides at UW Extension? Uh, well, uh, I, get, I would say uh, no. If you would like uh, some of my slides, uh, you can ask me directly, uh, but they're not just uh, posted anywhere on Extension. Okay. Um, any other questions? I'm sure you'll you'll have questions, you know, the middle of the summer when you're looking at an insect going, oh, what did Scott say way back in February? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's why the, the reference books are uh, so important or now, you know, like I said, the uh, insect uh, guides at uh, the Discover Life site. You know, that's that's a tremendous uh, 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 thing to have at your fingertips because most people you know they're not like me with a smartphone kind of uh, barely can use it uh, you know if you get to the point where you can access all the information that's on there there's even a thing um, I've tried using it a little bit uh, it's um, uh, I think it's called Google uh, Lens I think it is is the app let me bring it up and you can it actually has um, uh, it's a scanner and so you'll take you can put it into the photo mode it works pretty well you just have to know what you're looking at because it just automatically searches google for you yeah and can do uh, uh, like a pattern search so essentially uh when I got it, I, I had a couple pictures. I had a, a picture of a grizzly bear and I scanned it and it said a grizzly bear. And then there was another magazine I had that had a, a wolverine and I scanned it. 
and it, it came back a bear again. So, it, it, but it, it does have the ability on uh, photos. And I'm sure it's just gonna get better and better on those types of things. But uh, uh, like I said, uh, the ability to have uh, that, bugguide.net is really good for confirming your uh, IDs, like if you go through and say, hey, well, I think that's what it is. That's what the key says it is. Then go look at Bug Guide because it's a citizen science project where people are submitting photos and they're vetted by experts. I mean, uh, they're, um, it, it's amazing. There's some of them that are retired scientists from say the Smithsonian the institution that were experts on their particular um, uh, order or family. Uh, I found that out one time with a soft fly. I needed confirmation. I'd run it through a key. I submitted a photo to bug guide and a guy came back and says, yeah, I, I agree with your identification and his name looked familiar. And then I realized he wrote the key, you know, 30 years ago, he'd written the key on the thing. So it's uh, kind of interesting. <clears throat> so it's got a couple questions for you. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, what is the difference between palps and antennae? So antennae will be up, uh, usually the bases are on the face, either above, around, in between the eyes. The palps are always associated with uh, the, the mouth. So they are, um, you know, a lot of times they can be utilized for uh, taste. They think they have sensors for testing. Is that suitable food? And then another question. Does the damage of emerald uh, ash borer resemble the tunneling done by bark beetle? It's actually a little different. The, the bark beetles have a very um, uh, consistent patterns within their species, say like the uh, uh, mountain pine beetle. They form a monogamous pair of a male and female, and it's a J shaped uh, that goes, uh, the J is at the bottom and then goes up the trunk and then all the side tunnels out are their larva and uh, whereas the emerald ash borer uh, she lays she chews uh, the female chews a little bit through the bark and will lay an egg and then that larva just kind of feeds in a random pattern as it gets bigger and bigger and uh, I guess the native uh, ash trees in Europe and Asia, uh, they can sometimes outgrow the uh, young uh, um, emerald ash borer. And I don't know if they can also uh, secrete, you know, some sort of compound that helps stunt it and then essentially crush it by new growth. Uh, whereas our, our native ashes here in the US, you know, they didn't they don't have that uh, selective pressure. And so they didn't develop it from what I understand. They have uh, introduced a couple of the uh, 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 parasitoid wasps that attack emerald ash borers. Uh, uh, and I, I'm sure they're searching for other things that uh, they can bring in perhaps that are very specific to emerald ash borer only that will help in the long run suppress it. But at this point in time, the emerald ash borer is just outrunning all of that you know, in, the, in urban forests and also in the native forest back east where ash is a very important component. And here in the west, you know, like in Montana, there's a lot of green ash in say the Tongue River drainage that comes up into Wyoming too. So they're all vulnerable. Okay, another question. A couple more questions. <clears throat> Okay, the, 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 the timber, uh, like a pine tree that's been infested with mountain pine beetle, uh, it's because of that uh, symbiotic fungi that they carry with them. Uh, uh, and it, it creates that blue stain in there. It, it actually uh, assists in, in two ways. It clogs up the uh, xylem, uh, uh, which uh, pine tree could use to transport pitch to try to pitch out the mountain pine beetle. Uh, and, and it also makes the uh, pine tree more nutritious for the young of the uh, mountain pine beetle. And let's see, emerald ash borer galleries are serpentine or S-shaped. Yeah, they, uh, I'm not really familiar enough with them. Uh, is that, uh, Tara, are you uh, with the... Um, uh, State forestry. Uh, state forestry, yeah. The other uh, thing about them um, uh, that uh, helps to distinguish is they make a D-shaped exit hole when the larva have completed their um, life cycle uh, and pupated and go to emerge. 
uh, when they chew their way out, uh, they make a, a nice little D shape with a flat bottom, you know, in a perfect circle. Whereas mountain pine beetle or other species of bark beetle, uh, usually it's a perfect circle that they chew out. <clears throat> Okay, any more, any more thoughts or questions or concerns? Ah, oh, okay. So, Scott, another question. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you've got tiny holes on your baby kale. Uh, so that's uh, uh, early in the season. Uh, is that when you're seeing this pest pressure the most, Krista? Actually, it's usually late in the season, you know, like, late a, season. Yeah, mm. like August, yeah, September. And it's huh. even covered. I even covered to keep it, to keep it a little bit cooler. Um, huh. so. Well, that, uh, initially, I thought if it's early season, I was thinking a flea beetle. Uh, mm. that, uh, that I'm not really, I'm not a big fan of kale and I, uh, I probably couldn't identify a bok choy if it hit me in the head. But those are, um, knowing about them, knowing what your hosts are, then you can probably investigate uh, some of these uh, references and go into what are the known pests of your crop and see which damage is causing there. So if you're getting like shot holing or, you know, it's edge feeding, those types of things that can help distinguish your particular pest. So. Okay. Thanks. All right, well, it looks like we're, we're right at 8.30. I think that's what Catherine wanted me to shoot for. So, uh, and also consider me also as a reference for you uh, to, to reach out to, you know, when you're, uh, nobody knows everything, especially about insects. And, and, and uh, I uh, have been lucky uh, in the past, we had a lot of uh, people I could uh, take uh, ID requests you know, that I couldn't answer to at the university. Uh, now uh, I have to go outside the university, but uh, it is, you know, um, amazing the uh, uh, reference ability and, and the capability of some uh, people that uh, I can reach out to. And it's always good. It, it's good not to guess because um, just to, before we close out here, uh, last year uh, had um, a lady, she contacted actually Professor Scott Shaw, who runs the insect museum at the university. And she said uh, she bought a parrot perch from a, a vendor. And when she got it, there was a worm had emerged from it. And she was worried about it attacking her African gray parrot. And uh, Professor Shaw, he's like, well, I'm not the extension person, you know, it's probably harmless and surprise your parrot didn't need it, but uh, I'll, I'll divert you to Scott. And so I asked her more about it and it's like, well, she'd, luckily she'd preserved it. She hadn't fed it to her parrot or anything like that. And it turned out it, uh, it was a, um, a pest of, uh, that originates from Southwest Asia and that's probably where the purchase had been put together by people trying to make a buck uh, and then had been bought by a company that sold them through Amazon. And uh, this particular pest was probably not a big threat in Sheridan, Wyoming, but in, in Pakistan it is a serious pest of walnut production. And so it turned out this uh, particular thing, you know, then they went, uh, I, I got aphis, because uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to identify it to species. They sent it to their uh, specialists who identified it as this uh, quarantine pest. And then they tracked uh, back to the vendor who had them warehoused in Las Vegas. And they got shut down and quarantined and destroyed before it could spread around. So that's how we get all these things brought in, you know, unintentionally, uh, but it could cause a major problem if it was, had been introduced in an area where you know, walnut is native. You know, it's a, a new pest that doesn't have its things that suppress it. So, so you know, definitely you, know, you, you folks as master gardeners, you're kind of the first line of defense because you'll see a lot of things, uh, you know, and if, if you don't know what it is or uncertain, send it up the chain, you know, because like say we, as far as I'm concerned, an email I get with a picture of a bug 
is by far better than any kind of other email I get at the university. And I enjoy those, whereas the others I don't. And I'll be happy to either say, I, yeah, I think that's what that is, or, hey, we got to send it off and, and be certain. So with that, uh, uh, I hope you have the rest of your classes is, is uh, fun and enjoy your master gardener career and keeping my fingers crossed that uh, maybe next year uh, I can do it in person. Thank you, Scott. Too. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. As always, and um, I don't know, maybe maybe an advanced master gardener program in 2022, and we can all come over to your place and look at bugs and and uh, get better at this. Yep. Yep. Happy to have you. Uh, all right. Well, have a great <sighs> evening, and uh, we'll we'll take care. All right, Scott. Thank you. Bye. And everybody else, I will see you all on Monday night at LCCC, so we'll have an in-person class. And it's going to be on season extension, high tunnels, hoop houses, greenhouses, you know, that, that fun toy you want to put in your backyard, right? <laughs> so, hey guys, stay warm, stay warm, and have a good weekend, and I will see you on Monday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.